few months ago, I had the pleasure of sitting in a room in New York City with 30 educators. These educators were all part of our TED-Ed Innovative Educator Program. They represented a cross-section of administrators, school leaders, and classroom teachers from across 11 different countries. Now, in that conversation, I had the opportunity to ask all of these educators, what challenges, if any, have you all faced in bringing new ideas to your classrooms and to your districts? All of these educators had some sort of challenges. Some talked about the challenges of both building an educational system while being part of it, Others talked about the challenges of wanting to hold students to high standards, but also the difficulties sometimes in bringing those standards into their curriculum. And a few educators talked about their fears of feeling like perhaps educators are no longer respected within their systems. The things that surprised me about this conversation was the fact that these challenges and these fears seemed to resonate across all of the educators who represented such different backgrounds and such different cultures and countries. But what did not surprise me was the fact that all of these educators felt strongly that they could overcome whatever challenges came in their way and that they wanted to continue to try new things, whether it be in their district or their classroom. They felt the need to make their education system better, not just for themselves, but also for their students. And I guess I shouldn't be so surprised since they are educators after all. One thing that I learned though, is that a question we need to ask ourselves is how do we help encourage these teachers and these administrators in spreading innovation, in trying new things? How do we make innovation a little bit less daunting? How can we accelerate the spread of innovation? Chris Anderson from TED has one perspective of how crowds help accelerate innovation. And so he shares this lighthearted example. But recently, I've become intrigued by a different way of thinking of large human crowds, because there are circumstances where they can do something really cool. It's a phenomenon that I think any organization uh, or individual can tap into. It certainly impacted the way we think about Ted's future and perhaps the world's future overall. So let's explore. The story starts with just a single person, a, a child, behaving a little strangely. This kid's known online as a little demon. Um, he's doing tricks here, dance tricks, that probably no six-year-old in history ever managed before. How did he learn them? And what drove him to spend the hundreds of hours of practice this must have taken? Here's My and my step your game up, oh, step your game up. So in case you missed it, little demon six-year-old here is challenging everyone to step their game up. What's happening here? One TED speaker talks about how because of the internet, kids from all over the world are using YouTube to share their favorite clips, their new dance moves, and that is changing the face of dance around the world. Okay, so that's dance, but what about a different type of organization or system? You know, a while after TED Talk started taking off, we noticed that speakers were starting to spend a lot more time in preparation. <laughs> it was resulting in incredible new talks like these two. Months of preparation crammed into 18 minutes, raising the bar cruelly for the next generation of speakers with the effects that we've seen this week. What is going on here? Well, I think it's the latest iteration of a phenomenon we can call crowd-accelerated innovation. And there are just three things you need for this thing to kick into gear. You could think of them as three dials on a giant wheel. You turn up the dials, the wheel starts to turn. And the first thing you need is a crowd, a group of people who share a common interest. The bigger the crowd, the more potential innovators there are. That's important. But actually, most people in the crowd occupy these other roles. They're creating the ecosystem from which innovation emerges. The second thing you need is light. You need clear, open visibility of what the best people in that crowd are capable of, because that is how you will learn, how you will be empowered to participate. And third, you need desire. You know, 
Innovation's hard work. It's based on hundreds of hours of research, of practice, absent desire, not going to happen. A crowd. The larger the crowd, the more potential for innovation. And as I look around, it seems like perhaps we have the start of a crowd here. But an important thing that Chris mentions is that in that crowd, there are not just innovators, but there are people who are building an ecosystem from which innovation can emerge. Light. 15, 20, 30 years ago, educators who were looking for professional development might have been able to go to their school department, perhaps other teachers in their school, maybe even the district. Today, because of the internet and because of innovation, teachers now have access to great ideas from all over the world faster than ever before. And finally, desire. I have no doubt that there is a lot of desire in this room in particular to increase the amount of innovation in education. So how do we harness this desire? This is a question that we at TED-Ed have been thinking of a lot. And in the past four years, since we started the education initiative, TED-Ed, uh, we have focused on how we can best help spread innovation and help accelerate innovation within education. Now, for some of you who might be familiar with TED, you might associate it with technology, maybe with entertainment. I should mention, I think the entertainment needs to be replaced with education. Um, or you might think of design. But what do we actually do well? Well, we are actually, probably, strongest in being a platform for big ideas, your ideas. TED-Ed, in particular, is focused on sparking and celebrating the ideas of specifically teachers and students around the world. And so before we dive into a few different ways in which you all can get involved in the work that we're doing, I want to introduce a couple of folks on my team. The first is Stephanie Ng, who is our program manager, and she focuses specifically on the TED-Ed Innovative Educator Program and Ashley Kalaya, who is our program manager for our youth-centered program, TED-Ed Clubs. So we'll talk about a few different areas for TED-Ed today. The first is content, original content that is designed to spark the curiosity of students around the world. The second is our TED-Ed platform. So ed.ted.com is a platform and tool that allows teachers to take any video content to add questions and customize that video content. And finally, our programs. Specifically today, we're going to talk about our TED-Ed Clubs program, which is focused on inspiring students to not just investigate ideas that they're interested in, but also to share those talks and share their ideas in TED-style talks. So the first, content. Original TED-Ed animated lessons. Now, you might be familiar with the TED Talk, 18 minutes, right? All of you have experienced that. Well, when we started TED-Ed about four years ago, we asked educators and we asked students, what would you like to see? How can we make content that might cater best for the education system? The feedback that we heard back very nicely was, well, TED Talks are great. They're very useful. Maybe sometimes a little bit long. Maybe sometimes a little bit too much of one person standing there. Might be a little too long for the school system sometimes. So we re-envisioned what content could look like. And what we landed on was animation, short three to five minute animated videos that help students learn different topic areas by telling them a story. The process for creating this content is actually pretty intricate, but it's also a really fun process that I thought I'd share with you all. First, we work with teachers and educators from all over the world who pitch and suggest their best lesson, lessons that they want to be shared with the rest of the world. We work with this educator to boil down this lesson into three to five minutes, record that lesson, and then pair that audio with an animator who then visually brings this lesson to life. And then we have a TED-Ed animated lesson that we can share with the world for free. I thought I'd share just a few of these TED-Ed lessons.
And here on Earth, amazing experiments are being done to try to create life from scratch, life that might be very different from the DNA forms we know. Then, based on the distance between the two stations and the speed of his wheel and the number of notches in the wheel, he calculates the speed of light to within 2% of its actual value. But what will the sky look like billions of years from now? A particular type of scientist, called a cosmologist, spends her time thinking about that very question. He asks the guest in room number one to move to room two, the guest in room two to move to room three, and so on. Every guest moves from room number n to room number n plus one. There's a paradox to metaphors. They almost always say things that aren't true. If you say, there's an elephant in the room, there isn't an actual one looking for the peanut dish on the table. What do Harry Potter, Katniss Everdeen, and Frodo all have in common with the heroes of ancient myths? What if I told you they are all variants of the same hero? Do you believe that? Joseph Campbell did. He studied myths from all over the world and published a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, retelling dozens of stories and explaining how each represents the monomyth or hero's journey. So what is the hero's journey? Think of it as a cycle. The journey begins and ends in the hero's ordinary world, but the quest passes through an unfamiliar, special world. Along the way, there are some key events. Think about your favorite book or movie. Does it follow this pattern? Status quo, that's where we start. One o'clock, call to adventure. The hero receives a mysterious message, an invitation, a challenge. Two o'clock, assistance. I'll let you watch the rest of that video online. Leave you on a cliffhanger. These are just a few of the over 500 animated lessons that TED-Ed has shared with the world. And what's exciting to see is that they have reached over 300 million learners, if not groups of learners, around the world. But today, I actually just want to share about one educator and one lesson. Kim Preshoff has been a teacher, a science teacher, who's been teaching in upstate New York for the past 30 years. This is a picture of Kim's classroom, where she tells us that sometimes her students struggle to understand the vastness of biodiversity within the constraints of her four classroom walls. So we worked with Kim. We built her a jungle, a place where there are butterflies and flowers. We built her mountains, and we also built her an ocean with coral reefs. We built her an ecosystem that she could then share with her students to teach biodiversity. So how did this lesson work out for Kim and for her students? Well, I'm excited to report that the United Nations liked her lesson as they shared about it shortly after it was published. But more importantly, what about her biggest critics? You all know them, her students. Kim reports that in the past 30 years, she's probably taught this lesson on biodiversity to roughly 6,000 students. This is quite a lot of students, and she will continue to teach students in her classroom. But since working with TED-Ed and creating these lessons, in this past year, her lessons have also reached 500,000 learners from all over the world. The impact of these lessons is incredibly exciting, and the idea that we get to accelerate and share the ideas of teachers from all over the world is something that we enjoy. And so I would love to have Stephanie Ng join us on stage to share ways in which educators from your communities can also get involved. The TED platform has an open nomination process, which means any educator in the world can do what Tim, Kim did and nominate an idea for a lesson. But there are other ways that educators can get involved with TED-Ed. Let's look at our website, ed.ted.com. Our website is our platform where educators can create and find curated, customized, engaging lessons for their students in and outside the classroom. How does it work? Let's take a look. 
Here's our home screen, and you see our video carousel features all of the TED-Ed lessons our TED-Ed team has published alongside our partnered educators. If interested in searching the lessons by topic or subtopic, you can go right ahead and do that. You can also filter by different things. Maybe you're an elementary school teacher versus a high school teacher. Maybe you want a three minute video versus a 10 minute video. You can also choose to have subtitles on or off. Click on any of our lessons and you'll be able to see a bunch of our sample materials. It starts off with our video and some multiple choice questions. If a student is correct, they'll say, hey, good job, you were correct. If a student was incorrect, it will prompt up a video hint that will help push the student to, in their thinking and thinking in a different direction. Next comes some open-ended response questions. Sometimes it's really helpful to have additional content next to these videos. Maybe it's a blog post or an article or it could be some vocabulary. That all lives in our Dig Deeper section. Lastly, we have a discussion section where educators and students and the community can continue the conversation once the lesson is done. So an educator sees this and says, hey, how do I edit this lesson? Here's our button right here, customize this lesson. An educator can go on in and edit any part of the lesson to ensure that the content and the questioning fits for their classroom. So maybe period four needs a little bit more differentiation than period six. An educator can create multiple custom customized versions of a lesson, and this is the way to do it right here. Once all of the fields have been edited, um, the educator will publish their lesson, and then they'll be able to have a unique, shareable URL to share with parents, students, and other educators if they want to use that lesson. Educators can review student work with this button right here and see the progress students have made. Who found this content challenging? Who was inspired by this content that maybe I didn't know would be inspired by this? Lastly, if an educator has a topic that they want to create a lesson on that's not on our platform, they can use our Create a Lesson tool and they can type in keywords, a YouTube URL, and find that video right there. Follow the same steps, enter in your questions and your content, and voila, you have a new lesson. So an educator here in San Diego creates an incredible lesson for the 28 little minds in his classroom. How do we share that lesson beyond one classroom? After all, in the California public and charter school system, there are over 300,000 teachers and nearly 7 million students. Every week, TED-Ed features educator-created lessons and highlights them as TED-Ed Selects. With TED-Ed Selects, we're able to transform and communicate out a bunch of different lessons that educators have created, and not only have a massive scale that we can reach, but also transform the experience each child has in San Diego, in Santa Cruz, in Oakland, in Atlanta, in Brooklyn, even in Bangkok. As a previous elementary school educator, I used to be a third grade teacher, I remember that moment when I would have a lesson and I would remember that feeling in the room when my students would have a yes moment, when they would get something that I was not able to have them get before, when their minds were awoken, and when they were started to investigate into a land they've never been before. And that feeling, as all educators know, is precious and invigorating. But had I known that there was the TED-Ed platform and I could have put my lesson put this lesson that sparked this yes moment onto this platform, I would have also felt empowered because then I would have known that this lesson could have been a TED-Ed Select and could potentially reach hundreds, thousands, millions of educators and students all over the world. So we think about how TED-Ed Selects showcases the expertise of educators. How can we bring forth the talents and the ideas of our students? Ashley is here, gonna come up and tell us a little bit more. We have talked a lot about how TED-Ed sparks curiosity, and that is not just lip service, that is in fact one of the metrics of success that we use to determine how we're doing, internally, really, that's true. But what is a spark if it doesn't have anywhere to land, to catch fire, to spread? How can we as educators, as superintendents, as a room full of innovators, provide the oxygen, right science teachers, that those sparks need to catch fire and to reach their full potential. 
Now, you all know that I work for TED, so you might be expecting that my answer is going to be complicated and nuanced, perhaps take 18 minutes and be littered with a lot of Sir Ken Robinson quotes. But instead, I will give you the very simple, one-step answer that TED-Ed provides to educators and students all over the world. Apply to start a TED-Ed club. TED Ed clubs support students in discovering, in researching, and developing the passions, the biggest, boldest, quirkiest, weirdest ideas that our students have. TED Ed clubs are a way to teach presentation literacy. We at TED believe that no matter where you come from, no matter where you were born, no matter what your story is or where you're going, in fact, because of all of those things, there is no greater fan to that flame of curiosity than the ability to share your own unique story. In this world of digital communication, of YouTube and Skype and WhatsApp, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, presentation literacy is the new literacy. And we know that it can make all the difference in the life outcomes of the young people that we reach. So whether you are a homeschool leader in India who believes that your students should be able to communicate the work that they're doing with public school students in the area, or a superintendent in Cajon Valley, California, who uses presentation literacy not just to build the character and confidence of every young person in your district, but also as a way to build community by engaging every parent, every teacher, every principal, the custodial staff, and every student in this process. Or, the Italian Prime Minister, the Italian Minister of Education, who believes that everyone, every high school student in the country of Italy, should have access to the presentation literacy skills that are taught in the TED Ed Club's curriculum. First up Italy, next up the world. Wherever you are on that, on that spectrum, TED Ed Clubs provides a, a very flexible 13-step process to teaching some of those critical skills in presentation literacy. We start really simply. What is your passion? What is it that makes your heart beat faster? Session two, we talk about what makes a great idea great. Session three, we try to combine those things, smush them together and figure out, okay, you've got a passion. We know some of those things that we can sprinkle onto it to make it a really great idea. How are we going to do that so that you, eighth grader in Jakarta or high school student in Japan can tell your story? Steps four through 12, are the nitty gritty of presentation literacy, right? It's the research, the critical thinking, the visualization of the presentation, the rehearsal, the rehearsal, the rehearsal, the rehearsal. So that finally we land on step 13, which is how far and wide can we spread this little idea by presenting it and sharing it with others? Now throughout their club's experience, club members have the ability to connect with students all over the world. We have a quarterly event called Connect Week that is a very advanced digital way to connect students um, in where, they're, where they're able to ask each other questions and share their ideas. Hi, everybody. Don't stay in the And these two lovely ladies are from Ontario, Canada. TED Ed Club members also have the ability to connect with the incredible network of TED thinkers, innovators, and explorers like they did in this Exploration Connect, a special opportunity that, that we had just a couple of months ago where we invited TED speaker Jill Heinerth, who has, aside from me, maybe the coolest job on the planet. She is an underwater Indiana Jones, basically. She's, she's a deep sea archeologist, which means that she gets to explore forgotten shipwrecks, dive into, discover new ecosystems. And Jill has pioneered She'd become a pioneer in her field. She's done more for the world of under, underwater archaeology than any woman, arguably any person, certainly in our lifetime. And she agreed to hang out with us and do a live virtual tour where we were able to invite 11 clubs from all over the world to, to video call and tour her current expedition. And they were able to ask questions. We turned the reins over to them and said, 
What do you want to know from Jill? And they asked everything from what made you decide to leave advertising and become a diver? To what is that weird thing in the background? What do you use that for? To can you tell us a little bit about what the bends really are? And finally, to what did you do to be less nervous before you gave your first TED Talk? And then there you had it, in that moment, those young people, and it included elementary school students, middle school students, high school students from all over the world, felt like they had something in common with this titan of her field. They saw it as something that they could reach, that they could aspire to. So we, at TED Ed Clubs, by the end of your club experience, the idea is that these young people will be able to record and submit their presentations to us. And we try to be their platform, their stage, for sharing those ideas and spreading those sparks of curiosity. It may be, the stage may be our blog, it may be our club's channel on YouTube, or it may be, like for these four individuals, an actual stage. Now, I thought about going into the unique value proposition of clubs because I am a program manager. I am very intrigued by the sexy things like metrics and impact measurement. These are the things that I get really excited about. But at the end of the day, I figured maybe it would be better to let these club members t share a little bit about the impact of this club, uh, of their TED Ed Club, um, rather than have myself do it. Um, this video came to us from Abu Dhabi. It was, it's titled, An Ode to TED, Ed, to TED Ed by the Club Members. It was given to us without our prompting, and it was filmed without our knowledge. A group of students who got together every, every week to express themselves, to learn about their passions. It was a beautiful, long journey to every and each and one of them. It taught me new ways to deliver my ideas through a presentation or even through a small video for people to reach new areas of knowledge that they usually wouldn't think about. Uh, yeah, our club, mem uh, club members, they're very spirited, so I've gained more friends and they would listen to my personal stories and, and support me through everything I do. It does really change how you think of uh, going up on a stage and speaking. I, I used to think it's something, uh, you know, it's a talent you have in you, but it turns out you, you can actually learn it. The topic that I'm, I talked about was very sensitive and dear to me, and TED Ed really helped me honestly talk about this topic. The essence of TED Ed was to create uh, more confident individuals, and at the start it was hard for me to express myself, but uh, during sh sessions, uh, it became better and became much, much easier and more helpful. Tara just showed me the, the importance of having a proper structure and adding certain aspects to enhance my talk. Public speaking requires preparation and organization. And uh, before I thought that it was only uh, you have the skill or don't. It wasn't like the normal school clubs uh, that, that are just run by the teachers. It was like our club. It was run by us and it was for us. Um, I am a quiet shy person at nature and I never imagined myself speaking in front of a group of people and I managed to speak in front of 35 people. Inspiring. Honesty. Special. Uh, motivating. Challenging. Phenomenal. Personal. Developing. I opened it. An opportunity. It was different. Real. Undescribable. A journey. Calls this a journey. And she's just one of thousands of students who are on that same journey. There have been over 2,500 clubs meeting in over 115 countries in the past couple of years, inspiring each other, connecting with each other, and ultimately sharing and spreading their own ideas. I ask you to just take one moment to take a step back, to think about this crowd in this room, the desire to bring new ideas into education, the desire to spread those ideas. And I invite you all to participate with TED Ed in building an ecosystem and a platform from which ideas from teachers and from students can spread. Now, an example of that ecosystem are the speakers that we've invited to come speak at formal TED events, and one in particular. This is Brandon Allen. He is a high school senior from Michigan, currently trying to decide where to go to college. We first met Brandon when he was in a TED-Ed club about a year ago. We got to see footage of his final presentation. 
And as a result, we invited him to come speak at a formal TED event in November. At that same event, there were a couple of people in this room today who also saw him speak. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce Brandon Allen. Thank you.